A message cable in the deceased White's effect, sealed in a U.S. Navy watertight metal box, instruct him to, quote, eliminate a national security threat to world peace. Destination will be Houston, Austin, Dallas. C. Bowers regarding rifle. Okay, so we have his orders from the CIA, and after he was dead, he left it in this box, and his son found the box and opened it up. Okay, now, a follow-up cable dated September of 1963 says, quote, Dallas destination chosen. Your place is hidden within the police department. So they planted him in the police department. He had his uniform, he had his gun, so he looked like he was legit. The third memo, dated December of 63, the month after the assassination, says, quote, stay within the department. Witnesses have eyes, ears, and mouths. The men will be in to cover up all misleading evidence soon. Stay as planned, wait for further orders. Mm. Now, in the box were the names of 28 of the witnesses. All of them were killed within a year. Wow. Okay, so he seems to have murdered the 28 of the witnesses whose names were found listed with his orders. Okay, almost 200 witnesses linked to the assassination have met with violent or mysterious deaths. Some by gunfire, some in car accidents, some by apparent suicide, one by a cut throat, and another by a karate chop to the neck, and lesser numbers from more natural causes. Okay. Now, you might recognize this guy. This is Senator Frank Church. He's the guy that investigated the CIA uh, in the early 70s. <clears throat> At midday, November 22, 1963, immediately after hearing of the murder from Senator Frank Church, Averill Harriman went on to a meeting with other top oil executives where they discussed how to manipulate the new president being sworn in on Air Force One while flying back to Washington with Kennedy's corpse. In other words, it's business as usual. Let's just get on with it. How are we going to deal with Johnson? Okay, and here's Johnson being sworn in. It's the actual photograph. There's Mrs. Kennedy, Jackie, on his left, our right, and there's Lady Bird peeking around his arm, his wife. Uh, and there's the uh, uh, federal judge, Sarah Hughes, uh, giving him the oath. So that's on Air Force One. Lyndon Johnson confided to no one of his aides, or to one of his aides, in 1967, that, quote, he was now convinced that there was a plot in connection with the, ins the assassination, end quote. Uh, further, LBJ suspected that the CIA had, quote, something to do with this plot. That's an FBI memo. Okay? Now, a friend of mine uh, met LBJ on his ranch in Texas. Um, and LBJ said, oh, you want to see the, the ranch? Oh, sure. So they got in his truck and they started uh, tooling around. But instead of taking the roads, they went into the fields and they kaboom, 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 kaboom. You know, and my friend is saying, why aren't we on the road over here? And he said, I don't want him to get a clear shot at me. <laughs> LBJ lived the rest of his life worried about somebody taking him out. Okay? He was not in on this plot. All right. <clears throat> now, in 1978, when CIA spy E. Howard Hunt, one of the Nixon Watergate plumbers, and the guy, by the way, who was the engineer of the Bay of Pigs invasion and was really ticked at Kennedy because Kennedy called it off, okay? Howard Hunt, the plumber, he sued Liberty Lobby for $650,000 for defamation of character in a Florida court, and he lost the case. Well, what had Liberty Lobby done? Well, he sued because their populist newspaper, Spotlight, had reported he was in Dallas the night before Kennedy's killing to pay off a CIA-backed assassination team. Reportedly, Hunt huddled with Jack Ruby in Dallas the night before the assassination to supply him with a gun and money. During the Watergate scandal, Nixon was recorded saying to H.R. Haldeman, this fellow Hunt, he knows too damn much. 
way. Uh, that uh, was printed up when, uh, when Hunt died in the New York Times. The dying Hunt disclosed to his son, St. John Hunt, that he and others were involved in the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy, an operation codenamed The Big Event. More interesting is CIA agent Marita Lawrence's uh, testimony in Hunt vs. Liberty Lobby that the CIA directly participated in planning and executing President Kennedy's assassination, an admission that the media present chose not to mention in their trial coverage. Notice she is a CIA agent, and she's under oath in court, and she's saying the CIA killed the president of the United States, and the press didn't print it. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Okay, according to Lawrence, she rode from Miami to Dallas with two carloads of armed assassins, all CIA. She named each of them while under oath, and quoted their proud leader as saying that they pulled off, quote, the really big one. We killed the president. Okay. Now, it gets even more interesting. We're back to Tricky Dick. It is more than interesting that Richard Nixon, Kennedy's vindictive opponent in the previous election and the one who ultimately replaced him, had longtime personal ties to Oswald's hitman, Jack Ruby. Why is he not surprised? Yeah. This goes all the way back to 1947. And here's the FBI memo. Look what it says. There's the quote. Nixon intervened on behalf of a Chicago gangster. Okay, people always think that the mob uh, took out Kennedy. Well, they had some reason to, but the only gangster involved was Jack. The other gangsters were, you know, higher up. <coughs> Anyhow, Nixon intervened on behalf of the Chicago gangster who was about to be called as a witness before a congressional committee. It is my sworn testimony that one Jack Rubenstein of Chicago, noted as a potential witness for hearings of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, is performing information functions for the staff of Congressman Richard Nixon, Republican of California. It is requested Rubenstein not be called for open testimony in the aforementioned hearings. That same year, Rubenstein moved to Dallas, Texas and changed his name to Jack Ruby. So, Ruby had been in <coughs> Dallas since 1947 and had worked for Nixon's staff decades before the assassination. There's Jack Ruby himself. I couldn't put the picture of him getting shot because that's under copyright. But I saw it happen live on TV. Anybody else see it? Yeah. All right. He, uh, it was done in the basement of the Dallas Police Department when there was only supposed to be policemen there. Gee, I wonder if there was somebody on the staff that could have opened the door. Yeah. See, we already know. There was a guy planted in there. The jail Jack Ruby's last words to the uninterested party of Chief Justice Earl Warren, Representative Gerald Ford, a Bilderberger while yet in Congress and president after Nixon, and Leon Jaworski, later, later Watergate special prosecutor, are especially telling. And these are the exact words here that Jack Ruby said to these guys. He says, gentlemen, unless you get me to Washington, you can't get a fair shake out of me. My life is in danger here. Well, you'll, you'll never see me again. Uh, a whole new form of government is going to take over the country. And I know I won't live to see you another time. I want to tell the truth, and I can't tell it here. That was the, end of that. the investigators <laughs> left for lunch and never returned. Oh, wow. Gee. No, no news here, folks. Just you know, keep on walking. Nice Jack Ruby died shortly after a cancer in prison, having never testified publicly. But they got their report done. Look at the size of that thing. There's the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, handing their, his report to President Johnson. And look at the faces on these guys. This, this is just a, a pile of guilt. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, I love this one. Nixon's the one. Uh, I, I remember one time uh, uh, Nixon's uh, second 
uh, Republican convention that while he was still president, uh, this is in Miami, he was uh, walking in, you know, and everybody was cheering, and then there was this really pregnant lady standing right next to the walkway, and right at, she had a banner right across her big tummy and said, Nixon's the one. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's Tricky Dick there playing piano, and everyone remembers where they were when they heard about the Kennedy assassination, except one man, Richard Milhouse Nixon. He was in Dallas that very day with the very CIA men involved, but afterwards forgot where he was. Yeah. How many of you remember where you were that day? Yeah. They partied the night before. They partied the night before in Dallas. Yeah, I figures. Video on that. All right, well, we're almost done here. So there, here's the, the chain here. We've got Avril Harriman, the old crocodile. He's the one that gave the order. And then the big event coordinator was Richard Nixon. And he was connected with the CIA handler, E. Howard Hunt, his plumber later on, and, of course, with Jack Ruby. And Hunt then coordinated with Roscoe White, who was the contract killer for the CIA, and eight other guys who were the assassination and cleanup team. You understand what I mean by cleanup? Yeah. Yeah, that's the 200 witnesses. And then we have the Warren Commission cover-up, Starring uh, Chief Justice Warren, Congressman Jerry Ford, and Prosecutor Warren Jaworski, Leon Jaworski. So, uh, this is kind of a condensed version uh, of a lot of evidence. I mean, we're not going through a Warren report stuff here, but you get the idea. Okay. Now, uh, a week from tomorrow, I'm going to be teaching here. The uh, Adventure 8 of Restore the Republic, Other Paths to Power. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee saying, Don't vote for my evil twin. Those are the two parties. Uh, and the lesser of the two evils is still evil. And look there under the car. Uh, another four years, time to switch drivers going the same direction. Okay, so I asked several questions. Will Obamanomics drive the economy into the ditch? Can we trust the wizards and worm tongues of Washington? Can moral clarity penetrate the smoke and mirror of politics? And have we got a slogan for you? Let's talk politics, and then we're going to scan third-party agendas. I'm going to show you what the other parties uh, are up to. Uh, so that's going to be here, March 12th, uh, starting at 2 o'clock. We're going to end by 5, and there's a $10 donation. Uh, if you don't have it, that's fine. Students are 250. No one's turned away. Uh, next one. And if you missed any of the lectures, we have discs. We got for the first four lectures. You can use this disc and hurl history, so you can buy the discus. They're twenty dollars. Uh, so I ask you to surrender to your obsession for history, but don't go Greek to get a peek. And here's a Greek guy here saying, fiddlesticks, I wish I hadn't traded my clothes for this history DVD or agreed to pose for those pottery freaks in Athens. All right. I think that's it. Is that that's the last one? Oh, oh, Restore the Republic. Yes. Yeah.